forward to the interdisciplinary discussion that will result. Judith? Just to the short person version here. Uh, thank you, and thank you for inviting me to open this meeting. Uh, a very special thing about being here is that New York is my L1, uh, and I'm really always very, very happy to be here. Um, what I want to try to do today, and in this time that I have, is to give a, an overview as I see it. Uh, of where the field stands. And I want to say from the start that there are many things that I'm going to omit and many wonderful contributions that people in the audience here have made that I'm probably not going to touch on. Uh, and I apologize for that in advance because I think the field is at a very, very exciting moment. Uh, I just want to say that I have many acknowledgments and thank yous uh, to many students and collaborators uh, in many different places in the world that have enabled me over a period of time to pursue research on bilingualism uh, and the support of a number of external agencies. And as uh, Virginia said, that at Penn State we have a Pyre grant that has enabled us to have an international research network on bilingualism uh, in which we can send undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, and early career faculty abroad to do research on bilingualism, which when you live in State College, Pennsylvania, is a very special resource. Okay, in uh, the 125th uh, anniversary of the Journal of Science, uh, there was an editorial um, that identified the biological basis of second language learning as one of the top uh, 25 questions uh, 125 questions to be answered in the next 25 years. Uh, and that's, if you stop for a moment, that's a pretty astounding uh, thing because this is in all of science. And uh, what you can see on the right is a little snippet of data from Web of Science uh, showing the way that uh, research on second language learning and bilingualism uh, has uh, it really has increased over this last period of time. Uh, and the next slide is just some data uh, from uh, an article that uh, Ellen Bialystok and I published looking at the same thing, showing that uh, you can look at the uh, number of papers published on bilingualism in this recent period and the number of citations of those papers. And what you see is this gigantic swell of interest. And of course, the size of the audience here today is uh, uh, evidence of, of that uh, interest. And so the question that we can ask is, what have we learned in this recent upsurge of research? Um, and I'm going to argue that the recent neuroscience evidence in particular has really called into question the president presence of hard constraints on second language learning. Uh, and we've learned that proficiency may turn out to be as or more important than the age at which a language is acquired. And we also have learned that the brain may sometimes outpace behavior in revealing uh, insights into this learning process. We also have learned that there are some consequences, that proficient bilinguals may in fact not be <coughs> monolingual-like in their native language, uh, and that the native language may be open to change and the influence of the second language. Competition across the two languages may in fact reshape the networks that support each of the languages. So what I'm going to do today is organize my talk around three discoveries that we discussed in a recent paper in Current Directions in Psychological Science. Uh, and these three discoveries, I argue, are allow us to begin to organize this upsurge of research and understanding just what its implications might be. And those three discoveries are, first, that we now know that both languages are active and competing virtually all of the time, that bilinguals cannot willfully turn off, shut off, ignore one of the two languages, and that the representation of the two languages is not separate. 
We know that the native language changes in response to using the second language. Uh, and that, uh, that change has consequences for both languages, and I'm going to argue has consequences for the cognitive consequences of bilingualism. And those consequences, as we know in the papers that are being presented at this meeting and being discussed, that the consequences of bilingualism have been shown to be not limited to language alone, but to reflect a reorganization of brain networks that hold implications for the way bilinguals negotiate competition more generally. So the claim is that bilingualism has consequences for the mind and the brain. And what I want to do in the time I have available today is to try to very briefly illustrate each of these points. And in doing so, again, I'm going to be very selective. And, and these are illustrations that you may have your favorite uh, illustrations that you think would better make the point. Uh, and I'm happy to talk about that later on. OK, so first, uh, both languages are active and uh, competing. Uh, this is an illustration of a hypothetical Dutch-English bilingual. And a Dutch-English bilingual is often faced with a very simple task of naming objects that are very familiar in the environment. And of course, in the Netherlands, a bicycle is very familiar. <laughs> and even if a Dutch-English bilingual is naming something as common as a bicycle, there is a moment where there's a choice about how to call that thing. And so if you're bilingual in, in Dutch and English, and most Dutch-English bilinguals are, are in fact multilingual and, and proficient in more languages than just these two, you can call it a bike in English or you could call it feats in Dutch. And the question of how that decision gets made has been hypothesized to be really critical in thinking about how these consequences of bilingualism might develop. So the, what we know from the recent research is that at every level of language processing, from the lexicon to the grammar to the phonology, we see presence of cross-language interaction and uh, competition. So at the lexical level, we see these effects from one language to the other, even when bilinguals are processing words in sentence context, even when they're not required to use both languages, even when they're highly proficient in the second language, this is not an issue that's simply a matter of becoming proficient. Um, and even for language pairings that are highly dissimilar, this Morford et al. study is a study of deaf readers who use sign language as their L1 and who read English as their L2. At the level of the grammar, we see these interactions when structures converge, when you have, for example, similar word order in both languages, but we also see these interactions when they conflict. At the level of the phonology, we see influences of one language on the other at the very earliest stages of second language learning and also when bilinguals are highly proficient. So I want to try to illustrate a couple of uh, these points, uh, but noting a very, what I think is a very important uh, issue to bring into the discussion which is that sometimes we see these cross-language interactions in behavior, but sometimes we only see them in brain data. Uh, this is an example of a study, a very clever study, that was reported by uh, Tyrion Wu in 2007. And they asked highly proficient Chinese-English bilinguals who were living in Wales, and so they were immersed in English as their second language, and, and in school in English as a second language. And they were asked to perform a very simple task in English, simply look at two English words and decide whether they're semantically related to one another. No Chinese was presented in the experiment. Unbeknownst to the subjects, the English words sometimes had translations in Chinese that shared Chinese characters. And the question that Tyrion Wu asked was whether or not there would be any consequence of sharing those characters. And what they found is that when there was a shared character in the translations, and when the words were semantically related in English, there was an effect of the convergence. 
when there was divergence across the two languages, so in other words, when there were different characters, but the, uh, or when, when the uh, response was, yes, these two words are semantically related, and the Chinese translations that were not actually present had uh, different characters, or the same character, and they conflicted. What you see is that you see that there is a modulation of the ERP record. They do these experiments with monolingual participants. They show no effect. This is not something about the materials in the study. It's about activating the Chinese implicitly when the English is being processed. And in this study, they see this in the brain record, of, in the ERP record, but they don't see this in behavior. Uh, similarly, uh, there's a fascinating series of studies uh, coming out of Lee Osterhout's lab at University of Washington, uh, looking at the question of what it is that second language learners do in the very earliest stages of, of learning a new language. And here what they studied are people who technically are foreign language learners, so students like the students we have uh, in our university classrooms who have enrolled, in this case, in a French class. And what they show is that if you test students who are in a foreign language class a few weeks into the class, um, they know nothing. Um, they have you test their behavior, and their behavior is at chance. But then you begin to look at, use these uh, electrophysiological me measures to look at the neural activity, and it turns out they're beginning to show an N400 in the ERP record. They're beginning to show some sensitivity to the French, even though they're not even aware of what they, what they actually know. So they, they don't have very good metalinguistic knowledge about what's being learned, and their behavior um, does not suggest that much learning has occurred. So we see these interactions across the two languages, and we see them often in, we, see, we do see them often in, in behavior, but sometimes when we don't see them in behavior, we see them in the brain. So, okay, the second uh, point, uh, uh, illustration is that the native language changes uh, in response to second language learning and proficient use of a second language. And in many studies of second language learning, we assume monolingual native speakers of the language to be the comparison. And what we've learned over this period of time is we've learned that bilinguals are not monolingual-like in each of their two languages. Uh, so I want to illustrate uh, some of these uh, effects of the L2 on the L1, and these are effects of the second language on the native language for adult learners of a second language, so for late bilinguals. And I'm going to illustrate this through a program of research that we've done on speech planning, looking at the question, like the like the issue that was facing the Dutch-English bilingual trying to decide whether to call this a bike or a feats, um, how bilinguals decide which language they're going to speak and how that might tell us something about how the native language is critically involved in planning speech in the second language. Um, and what we see in these studies, just to give the punchline away, is we see suppression of the native language when the second language is planned. And we see that even in individuals who are highly proficient in the second language. And we see it everywhere, almost everywhere we look. Um, and what we sometimes, uh, again, we sometimes don't see these effects in behavior. Uh, we sometimes do. But we often see them in the neural record of uh, speech, that both in planning speech and in producing speech. One experiment that was done uh, in collaboration with Tao Mei Guo, who's here in the visiting from Beijing, uh, was an experiment where we asked the very simple question of what happens uh, in the mind of a bilingual when they're planning to speak a single word uh, in the second language. And we used it's a very, very simple paradigm. We simply had bilinguals name a set of pictures either in the native language and then in the second language, or in the other order, first the second language, and then the native language. And what we did is we recorded ERPs, 
And the pictures that were named were actually the same pictures. They were identical pictures. They were not presented in the same order, but they were the same pictures. So if you present the same picture twice, you should observe some sort of facilitation. You should observe some kind of repetition priming by virtue of the fact that you've already processed the picture, the meaning of the picture, uh, and, and there should be some, some priming uh, that's, that's observed. And so the prediction was we should see priming when you speak the, the name of the picture the second time. And what we found, and this is just a little tiny bit of the ERP record for CZ, so right in the middle of your head. And the critical result here is that uh, if you look at the data for the L2 on the right, you see that the blue line is above the red line. Okay, so what that basically means is that there is reduced negativity in the ERP record when the person names in the L2 after they've already seen the picture and had named it in the L1. You get facilitation of just the sort we predicted. However, what we see for the native language on the left for the L1 is we see the opposite. What we see is that bilingual speakers are showing greater negativity in the ERP record when they have just named pictures in the second language. So when they speak the L2 and then have to speak the L1, they're producing a, a pattern of results that we think is consistent with a pattern that's inhibitory. There is something that's been inhibited in the native language to enable speech planning in the second language. The surprising result in this study was that it lasted a long time. We thought, oh, okay, there's a little bit of, of suppression that occurs to enable the weaker second language to be produced, and then you recover. Um, and what we found, and we didn't design the study to look at this, but what we found is that that suppression seemed to last the entire duration of the experiment. So these, experiment, these, these participants, in some ways, I guess we shouldn't have we should have revealed this to the IRB. They never recovered in the experiment. That we somehow, we, we ruined them um, by virtue of having spoken their, um, their L1 after their L2. Now we do know that they do eventually recover, um, but it was not in the course of this experiment. So we asked the question then, do we see this effect in behavior? In this particular experiment, we didn't get traumatic effects in behavior looking at the time and accuracy of, of speaking. We then did another experiment where uh, we had, this is an experiment with Japanese English bilinguals at Penn State, students at Penn State, who are immersed in English as their L2. Um, and they are highly proficient in English as the L2, but they are dominant in Japanese. And we have two measures here. One is how they rate themselves on a seven point scale uh, in Japanese and English. And you can see the rating in Japanese is higher than the rating in English. Um, and then we can ask, uh, we ask them to perform a category fluency task, simply name as many you know, fruits as you can name in each language or animals you can name in each language. And what you can see is they're pretty proficient in English, but they produce more in Japanese. These are, are Japanese dominant people. Okay, so we then um, did the same experiment. We simply ordered the way pictures were named either in the first language and then the second or the second and then the first. And the critical result is that if you look at the data, never get this to work, yeah, here. If you look at the data here, where they name in the first language and then the second, what you see is you see this Japanese uh, dominance. You see that they're faster to name in Japanese than in English. And that's no big surprise. They're Japanese dominant, so they're going to be faster to, to speak Japanese. The surprising result is on the right. And so what we find here is that when they speak Japanese after they've spoken English, they're actually slower to speak Japanese than to speak, uh, than to, than to speak English. Uh, and moreover, what we see is that there's not much effect on the English. The L2 is, is pretty similar. It's the L1, it's the Japanese that's taking the hit when there is uh, this order of naming the Japanese after the English. And so we see a reversal of normal language dominance when we order uh, the tasks in this way. We then went on and did a very similar study with a slightly different design, again with Chinese English bilinguals. And here what we did is we wanted to look at the phonetics of production. We wanted to ask if these effects are really long lasting, uh, what happens when a person really just 
begins to articulate the word? Do we still see these interference effects? And so what we did here is we had people name pictures in their native language, then have an interpolated block of naming pictures in the L2, and then name pictures in the native language again. And again, there were some repeats from the first time they named in L1 to the second time. And even if we look at identical tokens, what we see is longer articulatory duration after having spoken the L2. And these, again, we should see, if anything, facilitation. We should see a reduction in articulation as a function of having had the repetition, of having had the benefit of previously uh, naming the same picture. Now we can go on and ask what, this, what the implications are for uh, how the control of, of speaking uh, the L1 is involved in, in being able to plan a speech by bilinguals in the L2. Uh, and uh, the claim that we and others have made uh, is that there are brain networks that engage executive function that are uh, engaged and to enable this kind of regulation of the native language. Uh, and a model that, that is very prominent in this literature is one that's been proposed by uh, Abu Chalebi uh, and, and Green, um, trying to identify different areas of the brain that may be implicated in the control that's involved when a bilingual speaker has to do something as simple as deciding whether the name of an object is a name in one language or the other. Now we went on and did some experiments like the ones I've told you about where we look at the different order in which uh, the two languages are named. And in fact, and this is again a study that was uh, reported by uh, Tomei Guo, uh, and where we looked at the uh, order of naming and compared two different conditions. We compared a condition where bilinguals named in the L1 and then the L2 or the reverse. And then we looked at the relationship between naming in a block where you're naming all in one language versus having the two languages mixed and cued by a color frame, for example. And the hypothesis we had is that if there was different, if there are different loci of inhibitory control, we thought there might be a difference between the areas of the brain responsible for controlling this regulation that occurs when L1 is spoken after L2 versus the, the switching that occurs in the context of a mixed language block. And so what we did is we, we hypothesized that the switching of a difference might be a reflection of local uh, inhibitory processes, uh, whereas the blocking comparison was more of a global inhibitory process. And without going into a lot of detail here, we basically found different patterns of brain activation for these different comparisons. So we found that the, uh, the what we hypothesized to be uh, <laughs> local uh, inhibition uh, engaged the ACC and the SMA, while the areas, while the task that we hypothesized to be responsible for global inhibition uh, seemed to involve the uh, left frontal gyrus and the parietal cortex. Now, I don't know that any of us would go to the wall to say, yes, these are, these are really the areas of the brain responsible for these types of uh, differences and that these differences necessarily are local and global. I think that we can spend a long time talking about how we might think about these different, uh, different components of inhibitory control. Uh, but the point is that this suggests that there is more than a single locus of control and that regulation is required when bilinguals uh, speak uh, the two languages and when they plan speech in these different contexts. Now, the L1 uh, affects the L2 at the level of the lexicon. I don't have time today to review the data on the grammar or the phonology, uh, but I will, you know, happy to, to talk to others of, about that later and informal discussion. But the question we can also ask is whether there are consequences over time. So if a bilingual is doing this continuously, uh, then what happens in the long run? What is the long-term consequence? And there's some evidence in the literature now that in fact bilinguals change as a function of having these experiences and that we can see changes if we look at the patterns of brain activation we see for the native language when we compare bilinguals and monolinguals. <laughs> and 
this research that's been, been produced, in 1989, Francois Grachon published a paper that got a lot of attention called Neurolinguists Beware, uh, not, not the typical title of a paper. Um, the bilingual is not two monolinguals in, in one person. And in fact, this was a paper that was objecting to the characterization of language mixing as being pathological, which is something that we know now is not pathological at all. It's quite common. Um, but the claim that the bilingual is not two monolinguals in one is something is, that's actually been supported by the research in this period since uh, Grachon published this paper. Okay, so on to the third point. Um, the consequences of bilingualism are not limited to language, uh, but reflect a reorganization of brain networks that hold implications for the ways in which bilinguals negotiate cognitive competition more generally. Um, so what is the consequence of all of this parallel activation, interaction, competition between the two languages? Okay, the claim, as it was originally put, was that juggling two languages tunes these brain networks. And so we end up developing cognitive reserve, even if we don't live in New York City. Uh, and we, we end up having consequences that spill over from language experience to cognition more generally. And of course, this is the kind of media attention that everyone has, has seen, uh, claims that bilingualism is really, really good for your, your mental, uh, mental abilities, for your cognitive abilities. And of course, as in all media, there are some distortions of how these claims are put that we want to, we may or may not want to take that seriously. Okay, but this is the issue that really brings us together at this workshop. Um, and so the hypothesis is that this juggling creates uh, a need to negotiate competition uh, and that the uh, languages need to be controlled. So bilinguals are, may have both languages active, but they typically do not make errors of language. There's very little evidence that bilinguals will, proficient bilinguals don't blurt out language in the wrong, in the wrong language. At the same time, they may code switch with other similar bilinguals quite proficiently, quite easily. Um, so there's some level of uh, regulation and control that's involved. And the claim is that bilinguals get to be quite good at this because they develop skill in negotiating this cross-language competition. And until very recently, this was really the story. The story was that bilinguals were mental jugglers, mental juggling's good for you, and mental juggling produces these fantastic cognitive benefits. Now the problem is the story can't be quite this simple. And what I want to do is I want to try to talk in the remaining part of this talk about how it may not be quite so simple. It's very clear that the regulation of the native language may be a critical piece of the story, but we need to know much, much more. So I'm going to argue that there really are five features of this problem that we need to dig into. Um, so bilingualism uh, changes the efficiency of brain networks, and we have evidence that that's true. But again, we have some conflicting evidence with respect to whether we always see this in behavior or whether we only see it in measures of brain activity. The second is that there's evidence that there are different consequences of bilingualism across the lifespan. Sometimes these effects are most dramatic for older bilinguals uh, and more dramatic for older bilinguals than for young bilinguals. Uh, and the evidence, and we'll hear a number of talks at this meeting, that suggests that uh, bilingualism may in fact provide protection against cognitive decline. Uh, the regulatory processes that we see or that we hypothesize are engaged by bilingualism um, appear to be trainable uh, outside uh, language experience, which also suggests that they may be domain general mechanisms uh, that uh, reflect these cognitive control mechanisms rather than uh, uh, just language control. Um, and they also, in some of the recent evidence, and one of the things that I want to point out today is that these are, always not, these are not always simple effects. These are not always a matter of uh, what people have come to call the bilingual advantage. This is not just about bilinguals being better than monolinguals on some task. This is about the way bilinguals uh, may coordinate these control mechanisms relative to monolingual speakers. 
I'm going to argue, and some of the recent uh, evidence suggests that uh, some of these control processes can be caught on the fly as bilinguals are processing language. Um, others are going to be more evident in the long-term consequences of uh, second language bilingual use. And finally, I want to argue that not all bilingual experience produces the same consequences, and we need to consider what that might be. Okay, this is an example, just and again an illustration, and uh, there are many, many papers that address this issue now. Um, but this is an illustration uh, from some work by uh, Jubin uh, Abachalebi and colleagues looking at uh, the way in which co a cognitive task, uh, in this case a version, a variant of the flanker task, uh, was performed by bilinguals and monolinguals. And the critical thing, for those of you who aren't uh, really or aren't that, that fluent in uh, fMRI data, the critical thing is what you see is that you can see from wherever you're sitting in this auditorium that there's more activation for the monolinguals than the bilinguals. And the critical point in this paper was to argue that the ACC, which has been implicated in uh, cognitive control of uh, a conflict, uh, is more active for the monolinguals than the bilinguals. The claim is that it's not that bilinguals and monolinguals are using different parts of the brain to solve the problem, it's that the bilinguals need less to accomplish the same goal, that the bilinguals are being more efficient in this process. And I know there's a lot of discussion in the imaging literature about whether you can talk about efficiency this way, it's something we might come back to in discussion, uh, but the point is that there are a set of papers that claim that you can see these kinds of differences between bilinguals and monolinguals. A second point is that um, we see more evidence for older uh, bilinguals, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I know it's going to be discussed uh, later in this meeting, um, but there are studies both examining the trajectory of uh, cognitive decline in uh, bilingual versus monolingual speakers claiming that uh, bilinguals seem to have a uh, shallower slope of decline on many of these executive function tasks than monolingual, than their counterpart monolingual speakers. Um, and in the data that really have gotten the most media attention and that are perhaps the most provocative, the claim is that life as a bilingual may provide protection against the onset of Alzheimer's dementia type symptoms, and I know that uh, Thomas is going to talk about this uh, later in the meeting tomorrow. And uh, this, is, this is a paper by uh, Gold and colleagues that looked at the uh, issue in, in healthy uh, aging of whether or not, uh, whether bilingualism in fact had any effect on uh, older bilinguals uh, without pathology. Uh, and this was, this was a looking, uh, this is an imaging study that used a switching task. Um, and again, it's a study that has a very interesting uh, dissociation between uh, brain and behavior and a dissociation between old and young. So in young adults, they found nothing. They found very little evidence that there was any advantage for bilinguals relative to monolinguals. For the older bilinguals, they found that there was a very clear advantage. And one of the questions that we need to ask is how we might even see these effects in older bilinguals, because remember, older bilinguals had to be younger bilinguals at some point in their lives. Uh, so we need to think about the, uh, the course and consequence of these effects in a way that may be perhaps more nuanced than the way we've discussed it uh, to date. Um, and again, these are not necessarily simple phenomena. This is an example, and again, I think Thomas will talk a bit about the varieties of, uh, of bilinguals in terms of the consequences for uh, the uh, diagnosis of Alzheimer's. This is a paper by Tommy Golan and colleagues that, that shows that these effects in their sample seem only to hold for uh, bilinguals who had a lower level of education. We can think about what that means in terms of how to think about the generalization of these data. Um, one of the most exciting developments with respect to bringing bilingualism and executive function together um, has come from a set of studies that have used uh, the 
dissociation that uh, Braver and colleagues have proposed to look at the difference between proactive and reactive inhibitory processes. Uh, and a set of recent studies uh, have shown that um, bilinguals and monolinguals may in fact rely on these proactive, reactive processes in some different ways. Uh, and again, the point here is not that bilinguals are better than monolinguals in doing these tasks, it's that they may regulate these processes in some ways that are affected by what they've learned over the course of their life by using two languages. And so in the, just very briefly, in the AX, this is the AX CPT uh, task, which is CPT stands for Continuous Performance Task. Uh, so the idea here is that you get set up to expect something to happen. So, and you're told whenever you see the A, if it's followed by an X, then you respond in one way. If it's not, you respond in another way. And then you can play the game of uh, tricking the person in, in lots of other ways. Most of the time, the A is followed by the X, but sometimes it's not. And you can ask to what extent uh, the cueing of this uh, information can be differentially uh, exploited by individuals who are bilingual. And in a wonderful study published by Julio Morales, who I think is here somewhere, um, that uh, they basically looked at a set of tasks, including a stop signal task, which in the past has not shown any differences between bilinguals and monolinguals. And what they show is that the claim is that it's not a simple effect of bilingualism on executive function, um, but in fact that bilingualism modulates the relationship between these components of executive function. Um, and so what we see is, again, it's not, that, it's not a main effect, it's an interaction. Uh, and then one of the, the challenges that we have is just how to think about these kinds of interactions, to think that what bilinguals are learning is how to modulate the information in their environment that will enable them uh, to reduce the uh, existing uh, competition. Uh, another study that uh, was recently published, uh, uh, again coming from uh, Tamay Goa's lab with her students, um, used the same AXCBT task, uh, but what they did was to give people uh, very long series of training uh, in language switching. So language switching typically has been studied by having people switch from one language to the other. So you name numerals, you name pictures, and you have one, one language to the next. Uh, and what they did here was to give people this AXCPT <coughs> test, and they use ERPs to measure their performance in the AXCPT. And they gave them a pre-test, and they gave them a post-test. And some people got this training, and it was training really that was quite extraordinary, 10 days in a row. Uh, it was not anything we could ever do at Penn State. The students would not come in 10 days in a row, maybe three or four, but not 10. Um, and what they did is they trained them 10 days in a row, and then they tested them again on the AXCPT task. And what happened was they found that the group that was trained on language switching showed a remarkable uh, increase in proactive control in the post-test on the AXCPT. Uh, and so it suggests that um, there are consequences of, uh, of language experience that then spill over onto these cognitive mechanisms because they're all shared in the same network. Uh, another, uh, okay, these, these are examples now of uh, how we might catch this on the fly. So it's, very, it's fine to study bilinguals and monolinguals and, and then uh, ask to what extent there's a correlation in their performance. But what we want and what these studies are moving towards uh, is being able to really begin to identify causally what bilinguals are doing with language that's producing these effects in cognition. This is an example of a study that was done by uh, Heinricke Blumenfeld and Viorica Marion. Uh, where they use the visual world paradigm, looking at auditory uh, word recognition. So you hear a word, and then you have to click on a particular place in this grid, and there is a very long uh, a history of research using this paradigm, both monolingually and bilingually, showing that uh, you get competition. So if you have to click on uh, the uh, 
you know, you have plum versus plug. You see the picture of the plug. Uh, what you have is you have phonological competition between these two alternatives. And we see that within language. We see that across language. In this study, they only did it within language, within the L1 only. And what they did, though, is they compared bilinguals and monolinguals. And what they found is that bilinguals and monolinguals alike show the same competition. Bilingualism does not fundamentally change this within language competition necessarily. But what they then did that was very clever is they went on and had a second trial where the person saw the grid again. But now the task was simply click on the grayed out asterisk in this grid. One of the four positions is grayed out. Okay. It turns out if a monolingual performs a task and the grayed out asterisk appears where the competitor appears, they are slower to do that. Okay, what they found was that the bilinguals were not where as the monolinguals were. And the claim is that what the monolinguals are doing is that they are still processing the consequences of that competition at the point where they're asked to perform this task. And of course, what we really want here is a time course analysis to be able to show these changes. And the argument is that bilinguals can more quickly resolve the competition that occurs in this language task than the monolinguals can. There's a very, another very clever study by uh, Guillaume Thierry's group, uh, again, looking at this idea that you can see the way executive function is uh, managed as a function of the language demands that are being made. Let's go through that right now. Okay, I want to finish by talking about the idea that not all bilingual experience necessarily produces the same consequences. Um, so the use of two languages may impose processing demands that create quite different profiles of bilingual cognition. Um, different forms of bilingualism have the consequence of tuning the neural networks that support language use differently. Um, Green and Abu Tulebi, in a recent uh, paper, have proposed something they call the adaptive control hypothesis. The idea being that you have this cognitive network that's underlying language use, and it's being tuned in response to the demands that are being made in language processing. So for example, some bilinguals may code switch and others may not. And there are a lot of studies right now, people looking at the issue of whether or not habitual code switching changes these cognitive consequences. But even if a bilingual is a code switcher, you may have two bilinguals who are equivalently proficient, both of whom code switch. But one may code switch in an environment where everyone is bilingual like themselves. Another may code switch in an environment where only some people are bilingual like themselves. And so they may be continually monitoring the environment for with whom they are switching and with whom they can not switch. Um, and that itself may impose a different a different set of consequences. So the ability to regulate these, the ability to acquire these regulatory mechanisms may really rely on very specific aspects of a bilingual experience. And as I said, I'm bilingual, there may be different types of bilinguals, and there are many different aspects of, bi of bilingual language processing that may be critical. So bilinguals don't just speak words. And in a lot of this research, we focused on speaking words. Um, bilinguals have to, uh, they, ha they do have to speak words, and sometimes those words are ambiguous across their two languages. They have to select words to speak. They have to process sentences that may be syntactically ambiguous or may conflict across, grammatically across the two languages. They may code switch uh, with one another. And as I noted, they may live in an environment where everyone's similarly bilingual or only few are. Uh, and they may engage in dialogue with speakers who vary in whether they are bilingual or monolingual. And I think we know at this stage very, very little about how to weight these different kinds of bilingual experiences in thinking about the consequences for uh, cognitive uh, function. Some people argue speaking is really the critical uh, task uh, in terms of language processing because of the constant selection. Uh, that are made. And there's a little bit of evidence that Karen Emery and Ellen Bialystok and Gigi Luck, who's here, uh, have, and their students have, have collaborated on a study that looks at 
bimodal bilinguals. So if you're a person who uh, speaks, but you can also sign, you can co-gesture, so you don't actually have to make a choice. And they claim in one published paper that you don't find any bilingual advantages on cognitive tasks if you are a bimodal bilingual, suggesting that sharing the same speech channel and choosing between these two alternatives on that channel may really be crucial. Um, the control uh, uh, also, and I'll just note, there may be some different consequences of control for language comprehension and language production. There's some evidence in the literature that the language control processes engaged by comprehension are more short-lived, are resolved more quickly, and that we see longer lasting, uh, more global effects in production than we see in comprehension. We don't know how, how these uh, spill over. Um, and I'll just note, there's not anyone here, I believe, who's going to talk about uh, babies that who are uh, exposed to bilingual environments. There's a very rich literature now on um, the bilingual babies, crib bilinguals, uh, showing that, in, in fact, they develop a host of, uh, we see a host of differences in the trajectory of their language development, in the trajectory of their cognitive development that suggests that uh, bilingual babies are different than monolingual babies in some ways. Those differences are different than the ones we see for adults, and we know very little about the consequences of those effects on what we see in the adult literature that we've been focusing on. Okay, what are the goals for the next stage of research? Um, we need to have an adequate characterization of bilingualism. Um, we need to ask the question, and J.G. Luck and Ellen Bielostock have asked the question uh, in, in a uh, recent paper, um, how bilingual does a person have to be? And bilingualism is not a categorical variable. We need to understand the range and degree of bilingualism. Uh, what is the role of the support uh, or lack of support for bilingualism in the context in which a person uh, uh, lives? Uh, whether a person speaks a majority language, a minority language in that culture, how that language is valued, uh, whether the person is a heritage speaker or not. There are many, many questions that have uh, not really been thoroughly uh, investigated. Uh, does the age of acquisition really matter, or is it really only proficiency? And perhaps they matter differently for different of these uh, questions. Um, there's been very little attention to who the monolinguals are. Many of these studies, we compare bilinguals and monolinguals. There's a recent literature that begins to show that not all monolinguals are the same, uh, and that uh, even native speakers of a language uh, may differ in their level of proficiency and in the consequences that their language use may hold. Uh, so I want to argue that uh, all of these things are really going to be necessary to have a comprehensive account of bilingualism. Um, I also want to add that much of the focus has been on language processing. There's been far less work on language learning. There's documentation that bilinguals are better language learners than monolinguals. And so we have to ask the question about what the consequences are for learning processes themselves. And those learning processes, of course, do engage the same executive functions that are going to be the focus of discussion. Uh, in this workshop, I think there's very little that we understand about that. So a bilingual may be a mental juggler, but the science of how, how that experience changes the mind and the brain and behavior is really only just beginning to identify the factors that we may need to have to have a comprehensive account. Uh, the message here is not that things are complicated, they are, um, but that research on bilingualism really does hold, we think, uh, enormous promise for revealing fundamental uh, properties, fundamental principles about cognition and its neural basis. So I'll just close by saying we would know none of this if we studied monolinguals alone. Um, the implications are not just for our interest and curiosity. Bilinguals are interesting for many, many different reasons. Um, but I want to claim that this really, uh, the recent evidence really requires a revision uh, in a very profound way of traditional stories about language development, about cognitive control, uh, and about the plasticity associated with language experience. Thank you. <laughs>